Hello, hello, hey everybody. My name is Jay Akunzo and welcome to The Big Simple. This is where we explore how some of marketing's biggest ideas today can make our strategies simpler. Um, a couple of quick reminders before we get started. Number one is we have a hashtag. It's not the big simple. Drop the the. It's cleaner. It's big simple. So we encourage you to share using that hashtag. And we do have time at the end for Q&A. So if you have any questions, use the questions panel in your webinar experience. Okay, so we're, we're going to kick things off in just a moment with a story. So please take out those coffees and pour some fresh notebook right now. Because our story starts in one minute. You've been warned. Imagine that you drive a Mercedes-Benz. I know, right? You're doing pretty well in life. Congratulations on that. But imagine that you decide to lease it instead of buy it. And one day, a letter shows up at your home from Mercedes-Benz and their financial services department. It says, Our records indicate that your lease will expire November 14th, 2018. We understand that you will be returning your vehicle and have enclosed information to guide you through the return process. And it goes on to tell you what you have to do, including an inspection and your responsibility for any repairs and so forth. That's it. Just that letter talking you through the end of your lease. Now, this kind of letter has a very real impact on your business, the reason you came to this webinar today. But to know why that is and how it affects you, think about the moment this letter arrives. First, you're probably not even thinking about your car in that moment. You're just checking your mail. But the moment you open the letter, you start thinking about a vehicle. And the first question is probably not, great, a checklist of crap to finish before returning my Mercedes. It's probably, well, what car do I want to buy next? In other words, you are now in the market for a new car. And unfortunately, Mercedes sales and marketing teams haven't sent you any information at all to ensure you buy another Mercedes. So naturally, as you start thinking about what car you're going to buy next, you think about Mercedes, but then you also drive to work the next morning and go, huh, that Audi looks kind of cool, and that BMW, and maybe I want to upgrade from a sedan to an SUV, or maybe I want to go more practical and go get a Toyota. The process that we're experiencing here is called active evaluation. We're adding and subtracting brands mentally, sometimes even passively. And when you're in the market for a product or a service, you start noticing all these things that otherwise would pass you by. You create this checklist, sometimes subconsciously, sometimes proactively. And that checklist moves you further away from that first question. What should I buy? And by the way, it moves you further away from the brand who sparked that question to begin with. In this case, Mercedes. In other words, Mercedes provided you a moment of inspiration. And that moment helped you start your buyer's journey. But Mercedes didn't do anything to ensure you stayed loyal to them. In other words, they let you lapse into active evaluation and start deciding whether or not you even wanted to continue being loyal. So how do we solve that problem? The loyalty loop. The loyalty loop is the big idea of Andrew Davis. Andrew was a TV producer working for creative powerhouses like The Muppets and Charles Kuralt. He's a best-selling author of two books, Brandscaping and Town Inc., and he's a globally touring speaker and seriously one of the best speakers I've ever seen. The Loyalty Loop is a simple but powerful framework to help us solve one very big problem. Because 
If we execute on the lessons we learned last time, developing our red thread, and if we earn someone's attention and prompt them to take action with our brand, how do we ensure that they stay loyal? More specifically, how do we ensure that they never lapse into active evaluation considering competitors instead of us? We, as content marketers, can do exactly that. But we have to understand this idea that we can turn micro moments into big business. This will help us create content that not only gets people to arrive, but gets them to stay. So without further ado, let's chat with Andrew Davis about the loyalty loop. All right, Andrew, I think you and I uh, work on similar types of projects. And so I'm gonna ask you the question that I get a lot from my friends. Uh, So what exactly do you do? (laughs) <laughs> so exactly what I do is write books and travel the world speaking to people about either what I'm writing uh, currently or what I've written in the past. Uh, and that's pretty much my job. Uh, I can't think of any additions. You've worked on that pitch. I really like it. I think, I think I've <laughs> lamented the fact that I can't really, I'm like, I'm, I'm make stuff on the internet. Kind of, kind <laughs> well, of I think you do more, you do you have much more creative work than me, like stuff like this. I mean, this is great. So oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, but I think people today are in for a treat because we're going to talk about the loyalty loop and we are going to break this down in terms of the Tamsin Webster red thread formula, which I know you're familiar with yeah. from, uh, you know, being friends with Tamsin and also knowing yeah. how she constructs speeches. It's incredibly smart for those who missed the first episode. Um, tough luck. You got to get in on this. Yeah, yeah seriously. <laughs> but we went over it last time with a lot of people who are here again. Thank you guys for attending a second episode of the four. Um, and so we're going to get to that in a little bit. So you're going to see Andrew's big idea laid out for your use, but I just want to get a little bit of the backstory because I think the context is so important. So the loyalty loop, in addition to being a super clever name, has been something you've been talking about and working on, and I understand now writing about uh, yeah. for quite some time. Where did this like first begin for you? So, so the loyalty loop is actually not a term I coined. Um, ah. I can't take credit for it. Okay. It actually came from a, a, like a McKinsey and Company giant white paper uh, that they had written all about uh, essentially the consumer journey. And in there buried was the loyalty loop, this idea that essentially as soon as somebody purchases something, you can build a great experience that creates new moments of inspiration and inspires people to buy stuff again. Uh, It's kind of my definition, but they talk about the loyalty loop is a really important part of branding. And so I read about that, um, oh my Lord, maybe eight (laughs) years ago. And the, the, the idea is stuck in my head for a long time. And I spent three years... Uh, like the last three years kind of speaking about it. So I built a speech first about the loyalty loop uh, and some of the experiences I had seen and a few things you could do to make a great loyalty loop experience. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of the evolution of it so far. I've started writing about it, have a video uh, series about it too. Can you share any moments of realizations that your audience or real world feedback gave you that helped you evolve the idea over time? Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is great. I, I mean, aerating an idea like this before I start to write about it helps tremendously because when I first started talking about the loyalty loop, um, I actually had thought about it so much that it was very, very clear in my mind. Hey, the loyalty loop is a series of micro moments that at, like deliver like intense joy and amusement and excitement for the consumer. And that's what they talk about. And that's what generates this. And so as I started going out there and talking about it, it became very clear to me that I was making these big leaps, things that I had thought about a lot to get to the point at which I could define a loyalty loop and the moments that make one up. Uh, But I hadn't brought the the audience on that journey. Uh, That was the first thing. And then so I, I had to take this giant step back and kind of revise the speech so that it had these micro steps where, where it's essentially, instead of just making an argument for building a great loyalty loop experience, how can I show people that this happened? Mm. Um, and uh, the, uh, so, the, so that helped a lot. And telling a story about it helped immensely too, which I didn't realize. So I would get off the stage and people are like, I like the idea of the loyalty loop. But it's a bit of a leap. I mean, they would literally say, like, how do you do this? The second thing that happened was after I was really good at explaining how you get there and having people's heads going, yeah, I see, like, we do need a better experience. Um, I tried to make another leap where I was like, hey, build a great experience and then market what's great about your experience instead of 
like marketing you, that you have a great experience and, yeah. and have no idea whether this, this experience me measures up. Um, and I thought this was really obvious to people like, look, now that you've grown some great experience, move the marketing to the front and people could not get it. And to be totally frank, I've had to cut that part from my speech and I've only I've been working on it either in my video series or even writing about it to try to aerate the idea for myself because I cannot express it well enough yeah. and easily enough to get people to understand. So let's go inside this idea and first inside why we're talking about it today because all four episodes of The Big Simple have a purpose and we ordered them what we feel is correctly so that we can improve one thing as content marketers, which is our ability to come up with a great strategy. And as the theme implies, big ideas, really well-researched, well-articulated big ideas make our work seem simpler. And to my mind, I can't come up with a good reason why so many content marketers put tactics over strategy other than strategy is squishier and harder and more complex and whatever, but it's super easy to follow a list of steps to tweet. Just get it done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we talked to Tamsin last time about the red thread and how to align your message. First of all, create that message that's worth creating content around, align your team and also understand how potential content and all different types of channels where the content can live can actually create action in the audience. Cause that's the goal, right? Yeah. When somebody arrives, that's not good enough. Yeah. They have to take actions with us. We don't sell ad space and impressions. Yeah. So Next, it's about, okay, so you, you have this message. Now we're getting it out into the market, which is where the loyalty loop comes in. And we want to target that message to the right stage of where the buyer is. Um, and so often I think we fail to do that in the right place. Yes. And we, we want that loyalty up front so that whatever work we're doing is actually sticky. So yeah. that's my perspective. Talk to me about, given that context, where you think the loyalty loop fits in a content marketer's yeah. world. So I think the loyalty loop fits in the content marketers world with just first knowing that you serve your audience and subscribers first, right? So think of the loyalty loop, the moment of purchase, as I call it, as the moment of commitment. This is when somebody signs up for your email newsletter, signs up for Unthinkable to get every episode of the podcast. That is a commitment. And now they are in your loyalty loop. And as a content marketer, it's very easy to start focusing on trying to get more people to follow you on Twitter, more people to get you, you know, to follow you on Facebook, and more people to subscribe and forget that you actually need to deliver something awesome and experience that's awesome every week in the loyalty loop so that they talk about it with other people and get more people to subscribe using their terminology. And, and actually, podcasts are a great example of this because I know podcasts do a good job of leveraging the reviews they get to get more subscribers. So they'll, instead of trying to market it the way they think they're positioning it in the marketplace, they'll use the audience's words to get it across. Movies do this very well too, right? Like they, instead of telling them the, the, you know, what they think the movie is about, using a reviewer's uh, you know, comments also helps get the, the point across in the right kind of way. So a loyalty loop for a content marketer is all about ensuring you deliver an amazing content experience after someone's committed to your brand right. and ensuring that you deliver on it over and over again, even if it's only the first subscriber. And if it's not working, the key is to actually change something first on the loyalty loop side after they've committed. What can you do to make that experience better yeah. so that the next subscriber doesn't have a bad one? Does that make that sense? makes so much sense to me. And I think, again, it, big, big ideas make things seem simple. Yeah. Um, the thing that I'm still curious about is when you think of loyalty, I think you push it towards the end or later in the marketing yes. process. I, I, I think of like loyalty teams at large corporations. Yeah. And I think of customer marketing and when lots of software companies I've worked for have hired yeah. a customer marketer, it's always later, right? The first mandate is always grow the reach, grow yeah. the names in the database, the leads, grow the number of customers. And then it becomes about retention and loyalty. Make, make sure they stay now. <laughs> yeah, which to me seems totally backwards. Like, ha have you experienced that in your career? Like, where, where was this observation? Yeah. How did this hit you? Well, uh, so the first time I actually realized that this was a problem was actually talking to a friend of mine of, of named Richard Yu, who was one of the founders of Rackspace. Um, and Rackspace is like one of the largest uh, web hosting companies in the world. And before Amazon had web services, Rackspace was the world's largest web hosting company. Um, and he 
he realized very early in, in the late 1990s and early 2000s that the, the, the business of web hosting had been commoditized. And they were just buying feeds and speeds and servers, right? Um, but he also realized that in that first dot-com boom, there were a lot of people who didn't know about feeds and speeds and web servers and numbers and data. They didn't even know what FTP was, which was like a file transfer protocol. It was basic if you wanted to launch a website. And he realized these people had money because they'd just been funded, but they needed help. And so instead of competing with all the guys in Silicon Valley, he looked at the next customer that walked in the door. They were based in San Antonio, by the way, and Texas is the friendliest state on the planet. That's part of their motto, right? Uh, and, and he decided that they were going to actually focus on helping customers mm. be really successful. So if you called support for a, t a web hosting company in Silicon Valley and said, hi, I don't know how to FTP, they would just laugh at you and basically hang up. They'd be like, what a moron, can't help you, buddy. <laughs> but if you called Rackspace, they would spend hours with you, helping you upload the stuff, downloading software that you needed to maintain your web server. And they started calling this fanatical support. And that's when I realized that what Richard had done really well was instead of trying to compete by getting into the marketplace with messaging that he knew would compete in the industry, he focused on making sure that every customer that came in the door would have an amazing experience. And here's what the difference is. When you were talking about uh, you know, companies focusing late in the game on customer success, he realized late in the game that he was so successful with his customers and they were charging more than other people for this great support because it was actually costing them a little bit more, but sometimes they were three times as much as the cheapest competitor. They started losing customers. And he was like, how is this possible? I'm, I'm losing customers, I have the best support in the world. And he realized their biggest liability was people who had never had web hosting anywhere else, who didn't know that, the, that this wasn't a customer service standard you could adhere to. So, so he really had to like rethink his strategy and he would let clients go uh, and have them come back a month later and say, I have no idea. It was bad, bad out there. Your fanatical <laughs> support is actually fanatical support and I can't thank you enough. So this is what got me really thinking about how you can leverage the experience to build a business instead of the marketing to build the business. It, it to me speaks to this, uh, the analogy I always use is, is as marketers, we're like digging holes in dry sand. <laughs> yeah. And everything we do is about we have to put the effort in or it doesn't stick. And what if more things actually stuck? What if more of our work compounded over time? You know, we're going to talk in the next episode to Jay Bear about his brilliant talk triggers idea, Great which idea. is essentially how to get your existing customers to get you more customers, right? That's right. But we're talking to you first because it's about, okay, how do you prepare that customer to have yes. the mentality? where they, they want to go get you other customers, yeah, yeah. right? And so um, we're digging holes in dry sand. What if we actually dug something that sticks? Yes. Another uh, example I've heard you give several times is we're obsessed with the spikes yes. way too much. Talk me through that. Yeah, so I think as marketers, and it's easy to do when you're looking at any analytics tool, you're like looking at the spikes for when you were really successful. And we're kind of addicted to it. You know, like you get a big spike, a lot of people listen to the podcast or show up for this webinar. Show, and you're yeah. like, yeah, I got to get next week's going to be just amazing. The next podcast is going to be even better. And, and when, it, when it is, you're like, yes, but now the next one has to be bigger than that. And so, and if you, if you don't get the next one to be as tall, you get really depressed, right? So it really is an addiction. And, and, I, and I think marketers that are really successful actually don't worry about the spikes as much. They, they do what, what a friend of mine, Brad Schwarzenbach, actually calls valley elevation. Mm -hmm. They make sure that the valley before this, the current valley is lower than that one. That means that you're constantly growing yep. and the spikes don't matter as much because the spikes happen and sometimes they're out of your control. You know, Jay tweeted it, so everybody got it that week. And I can't get Jay to tweet it every week. It's got to be organic. So what can I do next time to make sure it doesn't fall below it? And that's when moments of commitment come in. Can I get people to understand that they should subscribe every time they consume a piece of content uh, and, and make sure that that moment of commitment is so good that they really do love it and, and think about it? Because they're in their honeymoon phase at that point. As soon as they subscribe, they're like, this is, the, or you know, committed. It's like, I, I'm committing for a reason. What can you do to make sure that they're, they're very, they're, they understand the breadth of, of information and wealth of knowledge you're going to share. So we're going to go next to the pieces of the loyalty yeah. loop. We're going to put that in the red thread framework so we can understand it, use it in our, in our work. Um, before we get there, I want to ask you kind of a 
more personal question, why are you personally interested in this concept so much? Because you've spent a ton of time <laughs> speaking about the loyalty loop, yeah. writing about it on YouTube. I encourage everybody to go search for Andrew Davis loyalty loop because you've put together an amazingly produced series of videos right. that explain the loyalty loop in different elements and different moments, details of it. And it's just so well done um, and takes so much effort. So clearly you care about it on a personal level. Yeah. Why? I care about it so much because the people that I've seen implement this approach that have used without knowing it, it's not like they drew the loyalty loop and told their whole team, Hey guys, we should do this. Um, but they just instinctively understood that if they build an amazing experience and then market the best parts of that experience, they would be successful. And they have been, you know, I met, Everybody from a guy who sells roofing and siding to people, you know, the, the, and has built a massive business by changing the experience first to, you know, people like Richard Yu who built a billions of dollars worth of a company based on just making the experience different. Um, and what's amazing to me and what fascinates me most is that, uh, you know, even brands like Trunk Club have implemented the same things that Richard and, and this guy from Tulsa Renew, Steve, have done to make a huge impact in their everyday life. And I feel so passionate about it because it seems so elegantly simple. Yeah. It's like, and, uh, you know, having been in marketing for so long and not heard someone express this idea because uh, we hear a lot about build a great customer experience, but no one tells you how, you know, and they're like, you, you know, you just got to create a great experience and experiences are experiences. And, and so I, I really wanted to dive into the how, like, what is it that makes a great experience that gets more customers in the door every single week? What I'm struck by is most people, when they say great customer experience, I think they think of two different things. One is the actual customer support team providing yeah. a good customer experience, you know, yeah. loyalty programs, support tickets and calls and things like that. Yeah. Or in my world, which was always software as a service companies, yeah. uh, you know, or software companies in general, Google, HubSpot. And then when I worked in VC, we invest in a lot of these yeah. companies. It was always about the design, the tone of voice, kind of being quirky and startup-y and like modern yeah. web. Yeah, which is great. That's, if that's you, that is one individual tactic or element yeah. that might create a good experience. But what the Loyalty Loop provides is a way to point this same idea at a lot more things in your marketing. Exactly. Um, before we move on, I know I said it was going to be next, but you teased one of my favorite stories <laughs> about the Loyalty Loop. You yeah. mentioned a guy you met. And I know he's based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, his name is Stephen Jones. He's yeah. the one who provides siding, windows, and doors. Yes. Um, can you just briefly tell us that story? Because I yeah, think it's, yeah. it's genius. So I met this guy at a conference, um, and he wanted to show me his new website. And this, this exemplifies what's kind of wrong with our approach sometimes to marketing. He's like, I just launched a brand new website. You know, can I show it to you? And he had his iPad out. So he starts showing me the website. And I was, my speech was all about being different. So, you know, I said, Stephen, like, this isn't that different. What's unique about your business? And he shows me, he has an about us page and he shows me a video on his iPad of him talking about how different he is, which is not different at all, by the way. But in that message on there, he says in the, in the body copy, it says we provide the ultimate client experience. So I said, Steven, stop the video. What is the ultimate client experience? And this is what he says. He just like vomits it on me. It's not even on the webpage. He says, at Tulsa Renew, we, wanna know, we, know what's, we want you to know what's going on in your house every day we're on the job, no matter how long or something like that. I kind of messed up his quote, but it's basically that. And I said, wait a second, you're a contractor who provides windows, signing and doors to people and you're going to let them know what's going on every day you're on the job. How do you do that? And he's like, oh, let me show you. And I'm like, okay, he's going to show me. He takes me to YouTube and he shows me these personalized videos that he sends out on every one of his job sites every day he's on the job at 2 p.m. So he comes to your inbox. Imagine you're in your office, you get this video, and it basically shows you like, hey, here, there's a hole in the side of the wall. Don't worry, we're going to patch that up. Here's what we've been working on this morning. This is Bob. He's been fixing your door. It's amazing. And what happens every time he sends one of these videos, the first day he's on the job, he gets seven referrals. Uh, sorry, 11 referrals, yep. and he closes seven of them, which is, Un that's, that's the experience. Imagine being on the receiving end. Imagine leaving for work, not knowing why there's yeah. holes on your walls, right? Why the north side is incomplete compared exactly. to the south side. That's right. And then you, 
you get this video at, at work, not only are you feeling more empowered and more loyal to this individual and his services to Tulsa Renew, yeah. you know, especially important in a very saturated commodified yes, market, it's very true. Um, right? So on top of that, but, but also you're getting these videos on your phone and what, what did they do? How did they get those referrals? Yeah. So what, when you're, yeah, you're, you're like, Hey, check it out, Bob. My contractor sent me a video and your friend Bob is like, really? Let me check it out. Who is your contractor? This is amazing. And they say, Stephen Jones from Tulsa Renew. Give me his number. And that's how the referrals happen. Right. And they're showing how they're different instead of having to tell it. So when I, here's the kicker. When I told, when I said, Stephen, why don't you talk about this on your website? You know, where do you get all your leads from these videos? You don't, did people fill out this form? He's like, yeah, people fill out the form, but they're low quality leads because we're 25% more than everybody else in the market because he provides an experience that is different and he doesn't actually even need a website. And that's when it dawned on me, like this is a loyalty loop experience. And what he's doing is after that moment of commitment, creating such a great experience that he's even leveraged it in the, in the beginning, in the marketing phases now too. But Stephen Jones exemplifies, um, uh, you know, what is great about creating a great experience. If your experience is so good, you actually don't need the kind of traditional marketing that people talk about. So I actually found one of these videos on YouTube and I'm going to play it for everybody awesome. right now. Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Bear. Uh, first update of uh, day two. And as you can see, we've got flashing on the bottom um, here on the second pocket. We had that up yesterday. But now we've got the trim on, uh, one by two and one by four going across and uh, on the window. Let's go look at this over here. These small pockets take some extra time. Um, but we should still be painting by tomorrow afternoon or Friday. So thanks again, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Okay, so yeah. now this is the big moment everybody's been waiting for. So okay. if you have a notebook, get out the notebook. I have coffee because I'm energetic, but for me to keep up with this man over here, <laughs> I like seven of these. <laughs> um, but we're going to go into the loyalty loop. Let's, let's break down the component pieces of the loyalty loop and, and feel free to use examples and stories, but I want to make it crystal clear in people's minds and we're going to show, show those pieces on a slide so people sure. can, can understand them as we bring them up. So walk me through all the fundamental pieces of this loyalty loop idea. Yeah. So in, in the loyalty loop, if you're going to build the micro moments after that moment of commitment all the way to a new consumer, you have to focus essentially on four phases that your consumer goes through. And the just to wait, one, just to back up yeah. a moment. So there's yeah. there's a moment of commitment yes right yeah you want me is, to back up even further yeah. let me back up even further yeah let's, so let's, let's start, start from let's scratch start, so I'll, I'll give you a story that I, I i tell often because everybody understands this right i i was sitting at my kitchen table here in my house uh and i opened up my mail and all of a sudden I, I i get this letter from nissan finance and it's like hey your nissan lease is up in 30 days now i've forgotten this right so all of a sudden I need to buy a car in 30 days. And this is not what I expected to be doing this morning. So all of a sudden, that letter creates a moment of inspiration. It's a trigger in my mind that all of a sudden sends me on this journey I never expected. That moment of inspiration is not just mine. There are hundreds of other people every day, every hour even probably from Nissan getting the same letter, the same moment of inspiration. We're gonna come back to the moment of inspiration because it's really, really important. But all of a sudden I'm on this journey to buy a car. So the next piece is I have this trigger question. What car am I gonna buy? And the, the, the next thing that happens, this happens very quickly. The next thing that happens is your initial consideration set. What's the first brand that pops into your mind when you're thinking about buying this car, right? Well, I'm sitting there with a letter from a company called Nissan, the first brand is Nissan. But as I drive out into the world and I drive to my office, all of a sudden I'm thinking, hey, that's a nice car, maybe I'll get the Audi. That's a nice, I like that Jeep. I like the Porsche Macan. So I'm adding these new brands to my list. I'm sub subtracting brands from my list. And I'm going through active evaluation, this long process of trying to determine which car is for me. And this goes along, you can go on a long time in the car buying business. But if you're at a convenience store just trying to buy gum, all of this happens this fast, right? Yeah. Now you get to the moment of commitment. I commit to a new car. You commit to a pack of gum. Now we have committed to a new brand. Maybe you've even committed to a new piece of content, a, a new weekly newsletter, like, like Anne's bi-weekly uh, newsletter. Anne Handley, that's, yeah, sure. Yeah, Anne Handley. That's a, that's a moment of commitment. And from that moment on, my goal is to create new moments of inspiration, right? So let's think about Nissan. I committed to Nissan three years ago, and they've done nothing in their loyalty loop 
to make me loyal to them, to make me realize that this is a great experience, to make me think that as soon as there's a new moment of inspiration, I should just buy the, the, the next new, Nissan, right? They did nothing. They could have, here, there are some fundamental pieces. You can remove friction from yeah. the loyalty loop purchase process. So every time a new moment of inspiration comes up, my lease is up, they should have said, don't worry about looking for a new car. That's so much work. Just bring your car in and for $10 more every month, you can lease a brand new Nissan, a nicer Nissan. I would have, I would have driven that morning to go do that. Yeah. Instead, they lost me as a customer. They did nothing to maintain my, my, that one customer or help me tell other people. And by the way, the car we ended up buying was, was a Mercedes, which was more expensive, by the way. And it was because my wife had, had gone on a, 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 a girl's weekend trip with one of her friends who had the exact same car. And she came back and she said, we need that car. Uh, what is that? That's a great experience, right? right? And it's not, I mean, I know the car is great, but she talked all about the experience of buying it from a place in Burlington, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. She talked about the fact that you could get your nails done for free every time you took the car in for service. <laughs> that is the loyalty loop experience. So, so if you're if, like the opportunity as you yeah. laid it out is normally you have some kind of moment of inspiration in your yes. case, it was getting that letter and being like, all right, I need to now look for a car. So yeah. it launches you on a journey. Um, then you have this, like this, you know, trigger, I guess that, that starts the, like the question you are the question. Ask. Yeah. What, what car am I going to buy? What car am I going to buy? Yeah. And now you're going through this evaluation period, active evaluation. And the opportunity to me seems to be if you're great at marketing yeah. then you, if you're targeting the right stage in the buyer's journey, those existing customers, yeah. then you let people completely skip active totally. evaluation. Totally. And they only think about you. They're like, why would I ever leave Nissan? Look that's exactly what makeup. happens. And that's exactly what happens with Tulsa Renew. We talked about how Stephen Jones is so good at this that people, Stephen Jones, there's another one. So remove friction is one way yeah. you can actually create a great loyalty loop experience. But number two, and this is what Stephen does very, very well, is he leverages the experience itself to be something that people want to share in a really great way. And he does it by addressing the fundamental concern, concern of every one of his customers. So it, the first thing you can think about doing if you want to create a great post-purchase or post-moment of, of commitment experience is address the most common concern of your brand new customer. So all he did was say, what are they concerned about? Well, they're really worried that while they're not at home, we're ripping holes in the wall. We maybe didn't show up this morning. The, people have no, there's water coming out and gushing out of the house. I'll just shoot a video and address that concern before they worry about it or while they're worrying about it. So you can, so you can even tell in the Nissan experience, they could have done the same thing. Like right. my biggest concern is now going out and looking for a car, how much time it's going to take. How can they remove the friction to actually address that concern? So, so focus on those two kind of big fundamental ideas, removing friction and actually understanding their chief concern. And you'll start to build an experience that is differentiated. Got it. So now we're at the moment where, you know, I think the loyalty loop kicks in and one of my favorite yes. um, images burned into my brain because I've, I've seen the loyalty loop presentation several times is, you know, we're focused over here. We just talked about yeah. where we're usually focused. You yeah. should focus over here, right? So what happens right. next? What are the next so, pieces? So the next pieces in that loyalty loop part are four things. The, 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 and this is where I started with, sorry, but here we got there. Uh, you want to focus on raising anticipation for the experience. So let's talk, we talked a lot about kind of products. If you're in the service-based business, if you're a consultant, or even if you provide, provide a software service, you want to focus on raising anticipation for even the calls you're going to have with potential clients. Because just setting up on a calendar appointment is what everybody else does. That's a, that's a commoditized experience. What can you do? Can you send them an email that, uh, two days ahead that piques their interest and raises anticipation for the experience? Can you maximize the honeymoon period for that, that conference call even? The honeymoon period is the, the, the amount of time you have their attention after they're off the call, okay? Which isn't very long for most people. It's like I had a 30 minute call, but I got another 30 minute call, right? So you got two minutes where you can maximize their honeymoon period and they can say, wow, that was an amazing call. I've got to do something. What can you do to enhance that? What kind of experience can you deliver? The third piece is you have to re essentially re-inspire them to remember how awesome that meeting was. So get, get your mind in their day. 
They just went through four meetings in a row, one of which was yours. Maybe they even talked to two competitors afterwards and they're considering buying your product. They've committed to that meeting, but what can you do to re-inspire them to remember how great that first meeting was and how long of a time do you need to do that? Most people in their loyalty loop experience overestimate the length of time their experience should be. So they'll follow up two days later and say, I had a great call the other day. I'd love to follow up and just see if you had a chance to talk. No, 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 way too long. Like if, if you know they're doing three calls that afternoon or you know they're very busy, by 4 p.m. that day, you should be on the phone with them doing something different than everybody else to remind them of how great it was. And the whole goal of this, the fourth piece of consumer momentum, as I call it, so we've got raise anticipation, maximize the honeymoon phase, re-inspire them as quickly as possible, the whole goal is to stay out of relegation. If you chart the, anyone's consumer momentum curve, it looks like a gym membership curve. Like, <laughs> you know what? It, like, oh, yeah. I, I'm famous for this. Like, I'm like, I'm gonna work out every, every I'm, I'm like, I'm here, I'm just working out. And then all of a sudden, you know, three weeks later, they're like, we haven't seen you in two weeks. I'm like, wow, I was here for a week. I was very busy. You had a headband uh, on too. I can guarantee yeah, exactly. that you're the type oh, of guy with the headband, the whole thing. My headband, my headband said sick boy on it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it was, but basically you go through that, that exact curve. And at some point you're like never going to the gym. This is what I call relegation. And most brands like consumer and content experiences fall into relegation faster than the brand estimates. So they think, Hey, they forgot about us, you know, after a week, two weeks, sometimes it's after just 15 minutes. Right. So think about like what, where, last time you went out to dinner, you know, you're, unless it's a very fancy dinner, you might think about it for years, right? But if, if you just went out to dinner, you know, last week with some friends, you, you were excited about that dinner when you were with friends. Maybe the next morning you say to Zandra or your wife or your, you know, whoever you're with, wasn't that fun last night? Yes, it was. But you don't think about it days later necessarily, right? You, because you're in relegation. And my wife and I just went out to a restaurant recently and four days after we ate at the restaurant, she got a call because she had made a reservation by a phone to say how was the meal and she was like who are you like you forgot the name of the restaurant that's relegation right so you want to stay out of relegation so the four phases raise anticipation maximize the honeymoon period uh, re-inspire people and stay out of relegation yeah hey if you're an airline how about uh, if you want to ask me for what my experience was like don't send me an oh. email oh my lord hours later because it, it really is that short period of time i'm like nope yeah. i'm off that i'm, I'm out of the next trip or exactly. project I'm done i'm already um, checking in for the return flight so yeah. <laughs> that's like <laughs> it's so frustrating. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, so any other pieces of the loyalty loop that we should know about? No, I mean, those are the, those are the keys. I mean, we, we've got, we've covered a lot today. Um, and I'm trying to dive into them much deeper in the online world. Um, and I was just in Santiago, Chile. So this week's loyalty loop episode is all about actually this amazing laundry detergent um, company that I just discovered in Chile and how they're working to build their loyalty loop experience by changing the way they message in the marketplace. It's pretty cool. So here's, here's the um, fundamental question everybody's probably asking yeah. themselves. This makes total sense. Where do I start? Yes. So here's where you should start. You should start by thinking about the next person that subscribes to your content, the next person that makes a commitment to your brand, whether that's buying something or setting up a meeting or filling out a form. I want you to just first make a list of all the things that, that you do after they make that commitment. Then I want you to go to two competitors or, or other, other brands in the marketplace who do the same thing you do, like, uh, you know, with, with your form or whatever. And I want you to see what they do on the list. And anything that marries up, I want you to start axing them out. Okay? L like, literally, they're going to send a confirmation email. You send a confirmation. Okay, don't send a confirmation email. It, it, try something new. So the third column on your list, or the fourth or the fifth, depending on how many competitors you looked at, should be what am I going to try as the new first step? Mm. And I guarantee it'll force you to think about new and innovative ways to, to get people uh, after their moment of commitment. And for example, I don't have a lot of people that subscribe every day to the loyalty loop, one, two people. And I did this exercise for myself. And what I'm starting to do uh, is, is essentially, I, I went through and said, well, Jay sends an awesome confirmation letter. Uh, uh, so, do, so does Ann Handley, so does Scott Monty. Like I can't compete with their writing and storytelling style. What will I do? So I started calling people. Uh, which has been a challenge, by the way, because I realized it's hard to get their phone number. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm connecting with them on LinkedIn and making a phone call. And you cannot imagine how shocked they are 
that somebody tried to call them if they didn't get them in the first place. I leave a lot of voicemail, by the way, which is very efficient. Uh, yeah. Because I thought I was going to have half-hour conversations with all these people. So that differentiated experience already feels different to me. And I want you to just do that simple exercise. What are you doing with the next commitment that people are making? What are other people doing? And how can you do something totally different? The last thing I want to say here is as we run up against time, we're going to go to Q&A in a moment. So we're going to have some, some questions to, to answer here. Bring them uh, on. That doesn't scale, bro. No, the phone call. The, the phone, phone call? No, experiential things. Oh, if yeah. done well, yeah. there's a kernel there that's where you all, it always looks like it doesn't scale. That's right. And that's actually, that's a great lesson from Rackspace, right? When Richard first started providing amazing fanatical support to PP, you know, his first few clients, his team was like, God, we can't do this forever. Like, we're going to have to figure out a way. And Richard said, we can do this forever because this is a pillar of our business. The, the, this experience defines who Rackspace is. And we, it, I don't care if it costs more, I don't care if the product costs more as a result, we are gonna live or die because our experience is better. So yes, it doesn't look like it'll scale, but I guarantee you that Richard found tons and tons of ways to scale this experience, even built his own tools, uh, you know, helped, helped his customer service people come up with new ideas that would make things better for them. Uh, it can scale, but you have to start with the next customer. And that's what Richard did. That's what Tulsa Renew did. It's, it's what every customer and client that I've met going through this process has done the exact same thing. They started with one customer trying to change one thing that everybody else did differently. All right, and with that, we are ready for our Q&A section. Before we get there, uh, two quick updates from me and one from Brody Dorland, one of the co-founders of Divi HQ, uh, who makes this series possible. So the first from me is to alert you about our next episode featuring the great Jay Bear, October 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can sign up right now using that bit.ly link, big simple RSVP, and make sure you select October 31st from the dropdown. So we are going to talk about the evolutionary step from the loyalty loop, now that you understand how to avoid being relegated, avoid uh, letting your customers lapse into active evaluation, keeping them loyal. How do you then turn loyal customers into more customers, right? If you're going to focus a lot of your marketing on existing customers, how do you then equip those existing customers to do a lot of the, I guess, acquisition for you? That's what we're going to talk about in that webinar with Jay Bear. We're going to deconstruct his big, big idea and his brand new book, Talk Triggers. So you don't want to miss that. The second update is if you want to keep in touch with Drew, head over to his website, aka drewdavis.com. He's got a number of things there about his speaking, about his uh, video series, and, and diving more deeply into the loyalty loop. And I hope you will check out his series. It is, it is unbelievably well produced. Uh, and for the last update before Q&A, I want to kick it over now to Brody. Brody, you ready to go? Thanks, Jay. And wow, Andrew, the loyalty loop concept hits very close to home with what we do here at DivHQ. And I hope our customer success team has been taking good notes. Okay, quick overview for those who might not be familiar with what we do. Uh, our whole goal is to simplify the lives of marketing teams and help them achieve more together. Back in our agency days, we recognized a need for a better platform to help us manage the day-to-day -day chaos of planning content initiatives and collaborating with clients to get content produced and published efficiently. And we never found a project management tool that really fit the unique nature of the content process. So back in 2011, we built our own. Now, fast forward to today. Every day we work with many of the largest brands around the world to help their content teams manage their busy editorial schedules and simplify the, their content production processes. So if any of you are interested in learning more about our product, feel free to visit our website and you can either start a free trial or schedule a demo. We'd love to talk with you. Now before we get started with Q&A, I'd also like to announce that we recently launched our 2018 content planning report, which is a research project that we do every year with Top Rank Marketing. The research digs into how other content teams are structuring their content planning process, and the report will help you see how your content planning approach stacks up. We'll include a link to that in our follow-up email to you after the webinar. Okay, that's enough from me. Jay. Take it away with Q&A. So I got a few questions. These are great. Questions. 
Um, okay, so have you seen any examples? This one comes from Tamiz. Have you seen any examples of very large brands who do yeah. this well? Because I think when you talked about like Stephen Jones, yeah. it's an individual. Yeah, yeah. You know, these are companies behind them. Yeah, yeah. But you are speaking to the individual. You know, any large yeah. companies that do this well? So Rackspace is one of them. I mean, obviously does it very, very well. Sure. Um, and they've been able to scale that kind of stuff. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, differentiated and repeatable experiences, I think a lot of luxury brands actually do this fairly well. Um, so, you know, you can think of brand, brands like Ritz Carlton, where they're kind of known for knowing your name, right? And this is a very differentiated experience. When I go to a hotel, usually I check in and they say, hey, thank you, Mr. Davis, for coming. I'm glad you're a loyalty member, blah, 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 right? That's where it ends. No one else says your name. But when you stay at a Ritz-Carlton, they're one piece of major differentiation that changes the way you think about that brand and the way you even express it to others is using the name. So there are big ways to use small things that make a micro moment in that, that experience and really do change it in a big way. So I would look at uh, hotel uh, brands specifically. I do a lot of traveling, so this doesn't help. Um, and I can think of some more uh, to me. So I'll, I'll shoot you some and, uh, and maybe Divi and you guys can send them out, Jay. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, next question here. I think we have time for maybe two more. Uh, yeah, this one's from Marcy. And she says that um, they have multiple products and therefore content supporting a lot yes. like different products. I'm, I'm assuming yeah, yeah. that's what Marcy means here. Um, yeah. How do you see this working in that kind of company where there's maybe tentacles, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. I think, I think, think about, uh, to go back to the red thread from Tams and Snyder, sure. right? Like what is the unifying principle, the one thing that below all of those remains true and can help define the experience for after that purchase or a commitment to a specific product and use that as the basis for creating the differentiated elements for each of those experiences. So use your through thread, the bigger idea that encapsulates all of these products to create an experience that is different instead of just telling them it's different. Right. So, so this, this question comes from Justin, who I, I think maybe he is a solo entrepreneur, yeah. freelancer of sorts. He asks, you know, how, how would this work when you don't have the whole apparatus of a, you know, giant marketing operation? <laughs> um, Basically, yeah, yeah. can this work for a solo entrepreneur? Yes, solo yes, this can work for a solo entrepreneur too. Like, I'll give you a quick example. There's a friend of mine named Drew Tarvin, who's like a comedy uh, speaker. Like, he calls himself a humor engineer, by the way. Um, and he has a very differentiated speaking experience so when you see him he's he is really different but he doesn't he doesn't do a good job of marketing it that way because it's gotten cloudy and when you're when you're an individual what's really hard is for you to step back and to see what makes you different because it's easy to tell people that you're different you just don't sound it because you're kind of mimicking everybody else in the marketplace so if you're a solopreneur you're working by yourself and you're trying to position yourself specifically in the marketplace i want you to think about starting with the next customer doing one thing very differently that's based specifically on who you are. So like if you're a humor engineer like Drew Tarvin, can you build a post-purchase experience for his next client that immediately is different and shows that he's a humor engineer, not just a comedy guy, but a humor engineer. So focus on one thing and make sure that's the through thread for your experience, your red thread. <laughs> that's the, I think it's the perfect note to end on. So I want to thank you, Andrew Davis, for sharing your knowledge with us, your stories, your big idea for making our strategy work simple in content marketing. I got to thank Divi HQ and, and Brody and, and the team over there for making this series possible. When they first approached me to do a series like this, they were really excited to, to sort of rethink the webinar and dive more deeply into these big ideas. So I hope you're enjoying it. If you are, hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram, anywhere on the inner tubes. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty interactive, um, pretty available. And, and I want to thank you, the attendee, for coming and spending valuable time from your, your day with us. And I hope you got something from this and I hope you'll attend the next episode of The Big Simple. So with that, signing off, my name is Jay Akunzo. I'm the author of the book, Break the Wheel and your host for The Big Simple. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. We'll see you next time.